Are you interested in making data-driven decisions that will enable your business to scale and be successful in the long term? If so, then you've come to the right place. I'm William Glass, CEO and co-founder of Ostrich, and of course, your host of the Silicon Alley Podcast. Today, I sit down with Amos Schwartzfarb as well as Trevor Bohm, the co-authors of Levers. And this book is all about how to identify the key metrics and key analytics within your business that will ultimately lead to scaling success. You've got to figure out what those repeatable processes are, and they dive deep into why this is so important and how you can actually implement this in your business. In addition, they talk about the W3, which are the three questions you need to ask in order to truly understand who your customer is and what it is that they understand and love about your product or service. Together, they have a plethora of experience in the startup world, both within Techstars, as well as their own ventures and entrepreneurship, and also in venture capital. So we dive deep into some of their experiences just in general within venture, and at the end, talk about their best investments and uh, some of the ones that didn't pan out so well. If you haven't already, go ahead and pound that subscribe button so you get notified when episodes air every Friday. Without further ado, I hope you enjoy today's entrepreneur-focused episode of Silicon Alley Podcast featuring the Trevor Bohm and Amos Schwartzfarb. Are you interested in growing and scaling your business? Welcome to the Silicon Alley Podcast, where you'll hear from entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, and top performers on what it truly takes to grow and scale a business. You'll walk away with actionable insights you can apply in your own business and life. Now to William Glass, the CEO and co-founder of Ostrich, and your host of the Silicon Alley Podcast. Amos, Trevor, welcome to Silicon Alley Podcast. Super excited to have you guys on today. Cool. Thank you so much for having us. having us. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm excited to dive into all things entrepreneurship. You guys have written a really awesome book called Levers, and we'll definitely want to get into that. But one of the things before we hit record is we were kind of chopping it up and you guys have a really good rapport and dynamic between each other. I'm curious, how did you guys meet and come together and decide to write this book? Uh, I'll take the first part of that, Trevor. You can take the second. Yeah. Sounds uh, good. Um, so we, we met a kind of a long time ago, Trevor worked with another friend of ours at, um, at, at a, a impact accelerator called, uh, gosh, unlimited. Um, and there was a point, uh, several, a few years back where unlimited actually became part of tech stars and, um, and Zoe Schlag, who is the, the other person that we, we know in common and Trevor became part of the Techstars uh, family for a, for a little while. And so Trevor and I, we knew each other prior. We worked really intimately together in Austin uh, as you we know, were running a couple of different programs in Techstars. And, um, and, and so we just got to know each other really well, you know, investing together uh, alongside each other, building companies together. Um, so really kind of hands-on. Um, and then I'll, I'll let you, Trevor, add to the second part how did we how did we come up with the idea for writing a book <laughs> sure yeah i can do the i can do the book story uh so the the short version of how we came up with the idea to write the book was uh we've been working together both on the investing side and on the support side had it once okay now that we got these companies how do we make sure that they don't fall off the rails as they're uh as they're headed into whatever direction they're going. And, and we started to take what were pieces of, uh, of our own experiences that we'd been working using within our companies for years and years. Um, and, and as we were uh, taking those pieces and, and using them in the, in the investing and, and support and coaching that we were doing, um, it just all started to click together. And it just, I, I think, I think kind of mutually we came to this point where it seemed like, well, there's really um, not, not only this is valuable. We knew this was valuable to us. We understood the power of a metrics driven business and the, the perspective that we took and how to, how to get there, but it's really resonating with the companies that we're working with. And so I, I think it was Amos pulled me out uh, late one night. Uh, when we're working with a bunch of founders and sort of took me into the corner of a room and said, Hey, what if we wrote a book on this? And I thought, yeah, <laughs> wait a second. Uh, let's, let's think about this a little bit because books are just a, you know, such a, a massive project. Um, but it, it just kept, uh, it kept pulling and, and we kept working on it. And then, and then here we are today. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I think, and I just to add to that, one of the things, you know, that Trevor and I, when we were work, you know, when we work with these companies, there, there is these, 
two individuals that we would bring in a lot for part of the this process, which we've been yeah. running this process for a long time. We just named it in, in the book. Um, we would bring these two particular people all the time for, for their areas of expertise, which is around um, prioritization, product prioritization and financial modeling. Um, financial modeling meaning building your, your forward-looking plan, not your reporting backwards. And so, you know, when when Trevor and I finally said, okay, let's let's you know, let's see if we can pull this off. You know, one of the first things we did was we turned to Trevor and Cody and said, Hey, will you guys participate in, in the writing of this book? And, and so when we look at it from the, it is a big undertaking. The book is a huge undertaking. If you haven't written one, we had the fortune of having four people who have are experts in their field, being able to write about their thing. And then, you know, for, you know, Tre Trevor, you know, is, he's been a part of several books books being written, which is why he knows how hard it is. You know, we had his brain to be able to sort of wrap and say, okay, how do we make this something that's actually cohesive that people will enjoy and get value out of and not just be, a, you know, something cobbled together. Yeah, no, I, I and love it. It was Troy, oh. just a quick, quick note there. Yeah, Tro Troy, Troy, Amos, Cody, and I. What did I say? Four. I said Trevor, didn't I? Yeah, sorry. You no said problem. Trevor, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> no, no, two Trevors, yeah. yeah. Perfect. Yeah, <laughs> so that's awesome that you're able to bring in people from different areas of expertise to really focus on those key aspects of the book. I want to actually use something in the book and, and use it on you guys. So you've got this thing called, what, the three W's or W3. So what what is that? And can you use that to talk about who this book is for and why it's different than all of the other business books out there. Yeah, we, we, we can. Um, and we, we actually talk about this a lot and we talked about it even in writing the book. We do, we are very much drink our own Kool-Aid and, and we can go down a path to talks about how we do that as well. Um, so the, the W3, this is like, there, so let me step back for a second. There is nothing in the book that has not been talked about in some way before, right? There's no invention in the book. What we have done in the, the book is said, here are these concepts and we've created really simple to follow, hard to do, but simple to follow frameworks for each piece of, the, of it to, and, and put, to, put it together in a way that's really understandable and, and um, approachable. So W3 came out of... Uh, the time when I was at a, at a company that I, I stepped into a sales role, a sales leadership role, and the company had been doing, you know, several million dollars in revenue for a long time, but not growing. And so I had the fortune of walking into a company that had customers, but didn't know anything about their customers, which is why they couldn't grow. And so I, I, it really was me asking three simple questions over and over until I felt satisfied with the answer. And when I was satisfied with the answer, we put the pedal down on it. And it's, who is our customer? Or who do you believe your customer is? And more importantly, what is the data you have to prove that you're right? What are they buying from you? Not what are you selling to them, but what are they buying from you? Um, and then why does it matter to their business and to the individual buyer? And, and for all those things, like what is the data that we have that says we're right? And so when you can answer those three questions, any entrepreneur can try to answer those questions and have an answer. But when you can answer those questions and back it up with data, you know that you're set, you're starting in the right path, you can put the pedal down. Um, and so for, for levers, we are looking at business builders, meaning you know, people who are actually trying to build something that, um, that they, they have a, a theory of who and what it is that they wanna do. And they might be a little bit down that path, but what they haven't found yet is repeatability in their business. And, they're, and, and that's what they're looking to do. They're looking to how, how do I figure out the oper, operational, operationalize the repeatability in our business. And then we, I'll just take it a step further because we also teach levers, Trevor and I teach levers as a, as a course for companies that are a little bit further along. And for those companies, we're even more specific in our W3, which is the company should be generating revenue. They should have line of sight of nine to 12 months of of um, cash in the bank to run their business so that when we were, and there's a bunch of other things too, but so that when we work with them, they actually can focus on their business and not be stressed about making payroll or fundraising or whatever. And then some of the other things in that W3 are, um, there needs to be CEO led business, there needs to be at least one other senior executive on the team. Um, I'm sure I'm missing a couple of other things too, but yeah. That's the key. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, no, I appreciate you explaining that. And I think it's, you know, as you said, it's very easy to come up with an answer to those questions. As an early stage startup founder, I can throw stuff at the wall, but having the metrics to necessarily justify the W3, I think is really important. So 
what are some of the the metrics or things that you track to be able to say yes this is actually our customer and here's why like what are some of those things that you can be thinking about entrepreneurs can be thinking about that they need to be tracking to answer those questions are you just to make sure i understand your question are you speaking specifically to how we think about our metrics you know relative to the book or how what what entrepreneurs should be doing uh generally as they track metrics for their customer yeah, I was, I was thinking in generally, so applying it generally, but Good. if you want to okay. use levers as an example, feel free. Okay, maybe we'll jump in, but I just want to make sure, I, I thought that's what you were saying, but I wanted to make sure. And then and then I'll back up just a tiny bit, actually, because Amos did a, did a beautiful job articulating the first W, uh, but but there, there's also the other two as we think about who, who what this uh, is to those, you know, who it matters to and, and why. And quickly on those, the way we see that, uh, the what in terms of what it is that they're actually buying relative to the book, relative to any work that we do with them is really control. Uh, the, there's, there's a lot that happens in the world of, uh, of growing and building a business. And the vast majority of it feels like it's completely outside of your control, right? Um, you don't understand what's happening. You don't understand how to repeat what you, what the success you had in the past. So our hope is that we're able to bring control back into the driver's seat of the business builder through a metrics driven plan that's the that's the big vision and then the why there uh the reason that matters to the to the, the people who, who care about this right to the business builders who, who would be interested in reading the book is that they want to build the world that they see right like they care about building a vision of something they're, they're usually sort of compelled really driven by some picture of the world right? uh, that they want to create and, and this allows them to do that, or right? it puts them in the driver's seat in, a, in order to do that. It's not, it's not about fundraising, right? It's not about trying to pitch some really great story so that you can get a bunch of money, right? And it's not about uh, just trying to sort of, uh, you know, kind of hustle to get kind of whatever, whatever success you want kind of in the day to day. It's really about like, how do I put myself in the driver's seat and get to build whatever world, you know, is important to me. Okay, so that's that's a W three. Then to the metrics question, yeah. So the metrics are a are I love talking about metrics or or KPIs, key performance indicators. I think the vast majority there's a lot of good content on this. I think there's a lot of really bad content, and and by bad I mostly mean confusing. Uh, it's it's an area where like people get paid to make it sound complex and to make you think you that you don't actually understand what's happening right now. And so that for me the big sort of power of identifying the metrics that matter in your business are giving you the ability to make decisions. Again, back to this idea of control, like do these numbers help me make decisions in the business and do they help me focus on what matters most? And, and to that, what matters most piece is the, the key for knowing whether or not you've gotten there, right? for, for if you have something that actually matters is that you have some kind of metric that's geared towards a milestone that unlocks a new future, right? A new reality in your business. So, so again, to me, as I think about metrics, as you're trying to figure out how to identify the numbers that matter in this stage of the business, it helps you make decisions. It takes you to some key milestone that you're trying to get to. And that milestone unlocks something totally new. Like if you're able to get to, you know, some type of conversion rate uh, or some customer acquisition cost, then you're able to spend a bunch of money on that channel because you know that it's going to be profitable, right? And so then suddenly you ch you change, right? Your your KPIs are actually relative, right? Those metrics shift now because instead of focusing on customer acquisition costs and optimizing that, you can just focus on dialing that whole thing up, right? And just expending as much as you can in order to get customers activated and then keep them on on your product or, or service. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And yeah, thinking, thinking of metrics in a way of allowing you to make decisions that give you greater control of the business. I like, I like that definition a lot. Cause I think I know I've been guilty of it that you hear data driven decisions or, you know, all that kind of stuff, but there's so much data out there now that you can collect, but is it actually relevant to the business? And I think that is a challenge that I know I face and I'm sure other entrepreneurs face and, you know, based on your experience in this working with companies through Techstars and all the other ventures that you've done, what would you say are some of the key challenges that you've seen companies when it comes to identifying these metrics or tracking the right things? Like what are some of the challenges that, that you've seen? 
you, you know, there, there's a few, and I would say that probably, you know, and, and, and I bet you Trevor and I have slightly different answers here. So, so, so Trevor definitely chime in too, but I think the, the most common one is sort of the simplest one, but it goes, it, it, it parlays off of what Trevor just said, which is, or what you just said, which is there's so much data out there. And especially as an early stage founder, you know, if you're raising money or even if you're not raising money, but you're, you know, you have, uh, you know, advisors, whatever, you're trying to show that you've done something. And so what happens is companies become really metrics aware of the things that they've done that are lagging and anchor on those. And so they're trying to drive towards an anchor that looks at the past versus what Trevor was saying, which is, I'm doing things that are unlocking something for the future. And that's the difference between being metrics aware, looking at something that tells you what happened versus being metrics driven, which is doing something that is, for, is creating the next thing that is going to happen. Um, and so like another way to think about that is when you think about even, you know, looking at your financial model, which, you know, assuming that companies have even a basic one, the difference between, you know, you telling the model what to do and the model telling you what to do, right? You're trying to get to the point where the model's telling you what to do, but you have to do those things to get there. And, and so that learning process and being comfortable with making tons and tons of mistakes mm -hmm. as you learn that, that to me is the, the, the biggest challenge, I think, with becoming metrics driven versus metrics aware. The fear of like, if I make a mistake, I'm going to be viewed a certain way or I'm not going to be successful when actually the mistakes are what make you successful. The learning from the mistakes make you successful. Yeah, Amos, that's a great way to, to frame that um, in terms of, you know, focusing on the, the forward looking things, allowing the model to actually help you drive and make the decisions in the business. So how do you think about financial models then, right? Because I, I mean, one of the key, one of the things that you hear in the fundraising world, if in startup world is that ah, we all know it's wrong, the model that you're creating, at least early on, it's just, you know, what are the assumptions and thinking through, but we know that every number on there is going to be wrong. So how do you go from that sort of mentality into a model that drives your business forward? Trevor, you mind if I start this one off? Because I love, I love. I do. I want you to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool. Go for it. <laughs> so I, I think, I think that there's this notion where people, you know, like, like people have said, oh, we know your model's wrong. We just want to see it, right? And somehow that is manifested into this very flippant, like, oh, who cares? It's just a model. <laughs> but the reality is, right? What, 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 we're, what we're really saying is that it's not the numbers that we're focused on but it's trying to understand what are the mechanics of the business. And like, so if I'm an investor looking at your model as an entrepreneur, I want to see how you're thinking about the business because you're the one who's doing the complex brain work. And so if you're asking me to go do that work for you, like I might as well just go do the business. So I want to see how, you, how you're thinking the mechanics might work so that we can have an academic discussion about the things I believe, you know, as an investor believe and don't believe. More importantly, you as the entrepreneur, what are you going to go to do to prove whether or not the thing you, the, how you think it's going to work will actually work. The numbers will flush themselves out over years, not, not months, years. So like, how do we know that we're going to be heading in the right direction? Yep. Yeah. So I think that's great. And I'll add two pieces to it. Uh, Troy, who wrote the, Troy Yanikoff, who wrote the, the financial model chapter, chapter in the book, talks about the power of your, an assumptions driven model in anchoring the conversation, very similar to what Amos just said, um, towards the specifics of where you either agree or disagree, right? Well, in, in, in the logic or in the thinking. So it's easy to be, be able to present. So what does that mean? So in, in other words, it's easy to be able to present some hockey stick growth, right? I'm like, okay, here's how things are going to look. Here's what our, you know, performa looks like over time. Uh, but if you have an assumptions driven model, meaning if all of those, all of those numbers are actually um, resulting from some very specific uh, assumptions around who your customer is, how you're getting them, um, the cost for getting them, what the acquisition channels are going to be, what you're, all, all that, um, then you could actually go back to the model when you're having a conversation with an investor or whoever and say, okay, well, this is, this is the assumption I made, right? That actually drives that growth. Tell me where I'm off. Like, tell me where you actually disagree on a given assumption. And then you have a much more robust conversation, right? Cause then they're talking about, well, I actually don't think your customer acquisition cost is gonna be like that. Or they're saying like, I'm not really sure that you're gonna be able to, you know, maintain uh, that level of, you know, ratio of like salesperson to convert it, you know, whatever it is. 
And, um, and then you can back that up. Well, so well, here's my data, right? Here's the, here's the, here's the thing I went and tried, right? And the experiment that I ran that allowed me um, to conclude that this would be the assumption that I put in. So that's on the, that's on the fundraising side. But, but we actually don't think financial models are, are primarily a fundraising tool at all, right? They're, they're actually an operating tool, right? How does this allow you to see into the future so that you can make decisions for your business? And a, and a key part of that, and, a, and the beauty of the financial model is, is it it's gives you the, the, the ability to play what if, right? To run scenarios on what might happen within the business so that you can make a more informed plan. So you're able to say, okay, if I charged, if I increased my price by 50%, right, what would happen? If I increased my advertising spend by 25%, you know, what would happen there? And you can suddenly see its effect played out over time. And of course, it's, you know, riddled with assumptions that, that you'll get better and better at identifying over time. So at first it is all wrong, but, uh, but eventually it'll get more and more right. And, uh, and, and, and so that scenario planning allows you to say, okay, here's where, where we really need to go. Uh, based on the data that I have, and then go act on that plan. Oh, yeah, I appreciate you guys breaking that down, because I think that makes a lot of sense in terms of how to really utilize a model to make decisions, start with the assumptions, and then start testing and actually putting in real world numbers that you get that allow you to then play out the scenarios. How effective is that? Have you seen that? Do you have any examples of companies that have done this successfully? Or, you know, just how, how do you actually do this the right way? Yeah, lots of examples of, I mean, I, I would argue every successful company or almost every successful company has, a, has done this well. Right. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure that I know how, like some businesses can stumble into decent early success without it, but in order to get to true repeatability and scale and, and you know, be something that's, a, you know, providing value, I don't, I don't know that you can, you don't need to use our process but I don't know that you can actually do it without being, you know, truly metrics driven and have a financial model that is predicting, you know, trying to predict the future, right? That's what public companies do all the time, right? They're using their model to say, here are what we think our earnings will be every quarter. And when they're not, they know very specifically why, because they have such a good handle on their crystal ball. I'll give, I'll give three examples that uh, quickly that are different, very different companies and at different stages but um, each I think demonstrate the power of the model in their own way. So one would be a company called Creation Crate. These are all companies that, that um, we've invested in as well. So Creation Crate is a, um, it's a subscription box uh, for STEM education. So you help, help you or, or your child uh, learn how to unpack like different, build a robot or, or, or sort of other kinds of cool projects. And they have, um, they're so dialed in in their model, meaning like they, they so deeply understand how the mechanics of the business work that um, they're able to predict like really regularly what the next quarter is gonna be um, with like some pretty remarkable consistency. And, and so the, the power of that is then they can like go back and bet on, on they, they're able to sort of have confidence in what they um, what they're investing in, right? So they're, they're actually having to buy inventory at times. They're having to like make big bets on what the holiday season is going to look like, right? Because the holiday season is a key part of um, a lot of the sales, right? And they have that confidence because they have confidence in their model, which is backed by data. The second is um, a, a company called um, Skipper or Skip Town. Skip Town is a, is a um, retail sort of uh, experience for dog uh, owners, or I should say for dogs. What do they say for, for, um, for pets and their, uh, maybe uh, they have a term for their it. parents or something. Or... <laughs> and their parents. Yeah. yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's, it's like not pet owners, right? It's like the pet is the primary and then the, you know, the person is just along for the ride. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and they, they had a huge shift, right? So they used to be this uh, marketplace model for, for, for pet walking, right? Services. Mm -hmm. And uh, they shifted towards this retail experience, uh, in-person bar, food, dog park, cleaning, all kinds of stuff, right? Huge, big bet into this, into this retail space. Um, but they had a deep understanding of their customer and they had built this 
this really robust model based again based on data not just sort of made up in the middle of you know uh, the air and they were able to say okay how many down to the level of like how many drinks is somebody going to have every time that they come in like how frequently is somebody going to come in how long are they going to stay how much food will they buy right what what's the margin on each of those items and and that visibility allowed them to say one, we're ready to launch, which they launched in the middle of the pandemic, which is a you know huge feat in and of itself, and uh, and and they they beat actually beat all those numbers, right? They actually did better than what they assumed they would be. Last one uh, is a, a company called Home Buyer, and they're they're pretty early stage. Um, they're a mortgage lender uh, that uh, that that offers uh, really cheap, fast mortgages to first time home buyers, and um, and and the 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 stage perspective matters because they're at this part right now where they're focused on sort of really nailing the top part of their funnel. Like if we can really understand how it is we get customers, then everything else will trickle through. And and then and so he's very focused narrowly on sort of this heart, you know, this part of the model um, when most people would be focused downstream, right? Saying like, okay, well, how many actually, how many how many mortgages are we actually doing? Right, which is an interesting number, but it's a lagging number, and it actually doesn't help you that much. And so, by having that full model, he'll have active conversations. Right, we'll be talking all the time. And he'll say, "Hey, what? Um, uh, you, you, we're seeing this number play out, and like, and and my model says, like, if we can hit these numbers, then we're going to be in really good shape over here. And so, it gives him conviction right, and confidence to be able to focus on something that might you might feel." nervous about right you might sort of say ah no i need to go focus over here right because um it's not it's not resulting in these direct sort of impact on revenue um, but because he has an understanding of how that will trickle down eventually he's able to sort of stay the course right and, and optimize the part of the business that he thinks is most critical right now awesome yeah thanks for sharing those trevor it makes yeah it makes a lot of sense and i appreciate you highlighting how to do this successfully um, cause it sounds like this is almost a prior, it's a prioritization tool as well, right? Where do I spend my time based on the model, the assumptions that I've made, the things that are actually gonna drive the business forward. I'm not worried about the thousand things that I, that are, you know, asking for my attention as an entrepreneur, but I can focus on the one, two key things that are actually going to drive the business forward. Yep. Yeah, that's right. I am. Um, Amos, I've been talking too much. So go, go ahead. If you have a comment or. Uh, no, I, 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 I was just agreeing. I mean, I think, you know, we, we believe that too. And it, it, we've sort of built that into the process in, in itself, which is, you know, maybe an, another, you know, there's probably several like common things that Trevor and I, if you put us in separate rooms, ask us, what are the biggest mistakes entrepreneurs make? Like, we'll probably tell you mostly the same. And one of them is, um, is working on all the wrong things. And so I think, you, I think you're right, which is why we've built a piece of that into the, into the framework as well. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And I've you definitely, I, I feel like probably every entrepreneur is guilty of focusing on the wrong things at, at some point in time. And, you know, hopefully you figure that out sooner rather than later. Um, one of the things that you've talked about um, is one, you use the term repeatability, which is, I noticed it's different than saying scale, um, which I think is interesting that you denote that. Um, but there's also this notion of that the unit economics have to make sense in the long term, and if, even if they don't in the short term. Could you speak to that in terms of 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 why that's so important? Yeah, well, I will, and I'll, I'll touch on the repeatability versus scale first, which is the thing that the, the thing that I think people miss is that um, repeatability unlocks the ability to scale. And a big, another big mistake that entrepreneurs make is they'll, you know, they'll do a couple of things. And they'll say, great, we want to scale, right? I've made three sales. I want to scale our sales team. But you don't actually know how to do that. So you go and hire a bunch of people, but no one knows what to do, <laughs> right? Or whatever it might be within product. So repeatability <laughs> unlocks scale. Um, so uh, to, to, to answer your other question, um, which just escaped me because, again, I haven't had enough coffee. Scale. But, but, well, they're important because, you know... <laughs> At the end of the day, if your unit economics, it said the, the simplest way, if your unit, unit economics don't work, your business goes away because you literally don't have money to run it, right? And and it, and and there are you know you know cases, and you know I guess you know you can probably use um, you know Uber as an example of this, or you know some of the other you know uh, what was the Daily Deal site from a, from several years back that never actually had positive unit economics. That company doesn't 
exist in the same form anymore. They were able to raise a lot of money on the hope that they would get to go to unit economics at some time in the future. But the thing that understanding that you can get to positive unit economics allows you to do is it allows you to, to take more risk. It allows you to go and unlock the, the you know, different parts of the business you might not have been otherwise able to do because you always know, well, if I do these, if I just scale back or maybe scale back is even the wrong state. If I, if I bring it to these things, I can run a business for as long as I need to. I maybe not grow as fast as I want, but I understand it. And I also understand what, where are the points where I can put you know, the pedal down so that I can start to, to scale what is repeatable. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense, Amos. So in, in terms of this book, it's not just for companies that want to go raise venture capital. It's for companies that are trying to become profitable and maybe never take on capital. Is that, is that correct? Because that's what I'm hearing through the, the repeatability and the scalability. It's not necessarily you're advocating one, one route or the other. That's right. We're not advocating for, for a path. What, what our goal in this book, our biggest goal in this book is to say, you want to build a business. It's really hard. There's going to be lots of things flying from all over the place. This book will give you the, dis- the, the disciplines you need in order to figure out how to achieve the vision that you have for the thing you want to go do, regardless of the path you want to take. So we're not biased one way or the other against raising capital or not. You can be a real estate agent. In fact, we've, we've worked with a real estate agent who is looking to go from, you know, a, a sole agent to a multi-agent um, uh, uh, office and use our process to figure out how to do that. That's awesome. Yeah, no, I, I love that. Cause I think that, you know, obviously being, being in venture world, that tends to be what gets the headlines when a company raises a, a ton of money and you don't hear about the company that has slowly built up you know, up to tens or 20, hundreds of millions of dollars. And they're in some, some industry that is waste management or something like that, right? That no one's going to be, be talking about because it's not sexy. Um, so I, I love that you're, that you're supporting the entrepreneur. Um, but I'd love to get your take on, you know, the, the venture side of it as well. When you think about how Techstars fits in the ecosystem, um, how regular venture funds, I think, um, you know, have, have all... One of you guys was also with uh, like the Alexa team for a while, right? And that fund and corporate VC. So like, there's just so much out there. How do you decide as an entrepreneur, which route would be best for your business and navigating the various accelerators, venture funds, corporate venture that are out there? I think to some degree, it's largely a personal decision early on, meaning like, you know, if, if I'm going to go build a, me, Amos, you know, and Trevor, we're, you know, I'm going to speak for Trevor here because I, I'm pretty positive that we're in the same boat here. If we were going to go build a business tomorrow, we would put off raising outside capital as long as possible um, because for many reasons, but one is, you know, because we want to have enough understanding and control of what the business actually does before we take on the responsibility of someone's capital. And when we take on that capital, we wanna use it to scale because we understand repeatability, not to, not to you know, give us um, a leash to, to learn and see if there's even anything here, which there's a world where that exists. And I'm not saying it's more or less responsible, but it's a, it's a different kind of responsibility you're taking on um, and a different kind of capital you're taking on. So, I, and, you know, and I think there are some businesses that don't require raising capital, you know, maybe you can get there faster, but they don't require it. And there are other businesses, like if you're in biotech, it's probably pretty hard to, to build something if you're not raising outside capital. I, I think that's, you know, to Amos's last point, right? There are um, different kinds of opportunities require different kinds of fuel, right? Um, or different levels of fuel. And, um, and also different entrepreneurs have different, like, um, risk tolerances, uh, capacity, right? And, and resources to go execute on the world that they, they want to, they want to build. So there are a lot of, I think at the earliest stages, particularly, um, I think that's the beauty of the world we're in now is that there are so many resources that can, um, help entrepreneurs at the early stages, um, get, get moving. And that's the beauty of an accelerator, right? That's what, I mean, what, what, what programs like Techstars do really well. Um, and I think, um, People, the thing I would say around venture capital or sort of funding generally is that uh, 
if we're going to say one thing, it would be that most people don't really understand uh, the sort of implications, sort of the, the third, the fourth, the fifth step down the way, down the path of the choices that they might be making or that they would be encouraged right, to make um, re relative to, you know, to the business they're trying to build. So what do I mean by that? Right? I mean that um, most like, big VCs expect huge returns and not every opportunity or right, not every business uh, can can command that kind of return. And so for the entrepreneur, having a really clear idea of like, what kind of business do I wanna build? What kind of, how much confidence do I have in that, that business is gonna, is gonna be of that size? Right? And how do, I, how do I, if I don't have that level of conviction, how do I stage my commitments in a way that maintains the optionality, which is, which is what some of what Amos was talking about. We're saying like, how do I move forward in a way that says, even if I'm a $20 million business, right? Instead of a hundred, or a billion or $10 billion business, right? Like I still have a great outcome, right? It's still really good for me. It's still really good for the people who are part of, of it, you know? Uh, and uh, and I can, you know, ride off to the sunset. And, and then and rather than saying like, I've now narrowed the possibilities of success for myself in a way that I really only have one good outcome and it's, you know, 0.005% the chance, um, which for some people is great, right? They're sort of going for it, but, um, but I, I like to find ways in which to use the, the Amazon language. I talked about Alexa in a second ago. Amazon has this concept of two-way doors, basically like structure as many things as you can so that if you go through the door and you don't like it, you can walk right back out the door and, and everything's still, still okay. That makes a lot of sense. And I like that concept. And um, Amos, I think you used the word responsibility when raising capital. And Trevor, you, you hit on this too of, of once you once you take on investor capital, you now have a responsibility to that that party, right? So there's the the way that you make decisions changes as well as the implications for the decisions that you make as an entrepreneur. In terms of if if you if if someone's reading this book, levers, and they take away one thing or you know one major concept, what is the 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 thing that you hope they take away, or the action that you hope someone takes after reading the book? I think the the thing that I would want anyone to take away is that regardless of whether they subscribe to the levers process or not, that they understand the importance of becoming metrics driven versus metrics aware to set them up for the best possible success. Yeah, that's great. And then I'm curious to get a little bit more personal on each of, of how you guys define this yourself. Um, have obviously, you know, wrote a book that, which is incredible, um, a big feat in of itself, worked in venture and startups and, and all these different things. At this point in your life, how, how do you define success? Like, what does success look like to you? Personal, professional, what, whatever success is to you. Yeah, I for me it, for me I think about this a lot actually, and I have a lot in the last couple of years. It's two for me. It's two things. One, am I making an impact, a noticeable and ideally quantifiable impact on the people around me that I'm you know that I'm working with? And I think you know to, just to that point, like the answer to your last question. Um, we don't care if you don't use our process. We want you to be impacted by the notion of it. More importantly, and if you and if you subscribe to it and you share it with others because you think it's great, that's an extra bonus. But you know, the out the, the hope is we're making an impact on on people. So so one is the impact, and and the other thing for me personally, when I'm when I'm trying to achieve something, is do I have a clear understanding of what the goal that I'm trying to achieve is? Do I hit it? And if I don't hit it, do I understand why? And it's okay if I don't hit it, but if I understand why, I look at that as success also. Yeah, I like that a lot. Understanding understanding why, right? Because I, I think pretty much everyone has had a goal and either not stuck to it or missed it or, or whatever it is in whatever aspect of your life. So I really like that that focus on at least understanding why if I don't achieve something. What about you, T? Yeah. So there's a, I'll give two answers to the question. The first is sort of uh, more uh, almost superficial, which is just, I, I, I like building things. Like I like seeing things that don't exist in the world start to exist. Right. So that's, that's fun to me. And, uh, and I just enjoy it. And, and I probably am too uh, 
uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty fun driven, meaning like, I just like doing things that I like doing. Right? <laughs> and, and so if I don't like doing it, I'm like, I don't know much. I want to do that. Not that, that, not that hard work isn't a component of that. Right. But I'm sort of compelled to something that just sounds really good to me and, and exciting to me. So I'm, I'm, I'm willing to sort of put in the, um, the, the discipline, right. To get there. So that's one answer. The second is really, I find myself to be not dissimilar to what Amos just said, very people driven and, there's an old story that I'm stealing from a book, uh, his name I, I can't remember right now, it talks about these two politicians in, in England and, uh, and they sort of contrast the two people and they say, you know, about this one politician, you would talk to him and after you talked to him, you left that dinner party, right? Thinking, man, that is the most interesting, uh, most you know, fascinating, intelligent person I've ever met. And then there's this other politician that you have conversations with. And then after you leave that, you know, same dinner party and you're talking about um, the conversation you had, you say, man, that person made me feel like the most interesting, you know, the most intelligent, the most fascinating person I've ever met. And, and to me, it's that second uh, person that I, that I aspire to, to be. And, and the language that they put it, again, I'm stealing from this book, but it's the idea of how do you identify the treasure within someone else? and then put it to good use. So, so for me, if, if my life could be about, about anything, it would, it would be about that. Yeah. That's oh, awesome. That, I haven't heard that story. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that is Do you, have you, have you uh, found any success or certain things that you've done that, that uh, how you've been able to unlock treasure, that treasure in other people, anything that tactics, things that you've done? Yeah. 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 Uh, just be curious. Right? Like if you just get genuinely interested in, in what other people are doing and what they care about and you learn how to ask questions that help to draw that out in a way that um, helps where you see them light up right, and, and get excited and, and hopefully get clear, right? get a, a better sense of clarity into their own thinking. And I, like, um, like even sort of there's like your own internal dialogue, right? How do you have more better, better conversation, helping others have better conversations with themselves, right? That uh, I think that goes a long way in that direction. I think, and I'll just chime in that Tre Trevor is exceptional at doing that, at making people feel, everybody feels special. Um, and he, what I think is exceptional about the way that he does that is he does it in a really subtle way. It happens and no one realizes it's happened until after it's done. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> I love that. So one of the kind of to wrap up the show, um, my focus is on personal finance. And uh, I'd love to ask you guys a couple questions around that, especially coming from an investor space. I think you guys have some interesting, uh, interesting thoughts around it. Um, but how would you describe your relationship with money? Uh Man, I have, I, I grew up pretty poor and I grew up with, um, you know, I just had this conversation with my father a couple of weeks ago where he was out of the blue, apologized for me for not giving me more education around personal finance. Um, I have a, I have a fear, like, like for me, money is like a, um, that not having it is, is scary. And I, I would say it is, uh, is probably in some ways made me a, gr a better investor and in some ways have maybe even held me back. So I probably had, I've had both things, but um, uh, I'm, I'm grappling with that now as I try to loosen up my fear and understand it more deeply. Yeah, that's interesting. And I, you're not alone there when it comes to fear. I think that's one of the, the most common, <laughs> common responses, unfortunately, fear and shame. I get that a lot as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Trevor, what about you? Uh yeah, this is a fun question. So I, uh, I have probably a couple of, of sort of perspectives on, on personal finance. I think growing up, I had a, like a lot of interest in, uh, in, in money and, and almost like in the game sense of the way. Um, so I would, my, my dad introduced me to the stock market like really early on um and i had saved up some money you know from from working uh like odd jobs right like I, since i was like seven i'd been pulling weeds and mowing lawns way too early right i, I was like behind a lawnmower at like age literally age seven i can't imagine as a, as, as a parent of a four-year-old i can't imagine my <laughs> child mowing lawns for somebody else in three years but uh 
but anyway, I had a, I had a little bit of money to put it in the stock market, and um, the, I'm sort of revealing my age here, but I thought, okay, what do I put my money into? I'll do it. The two, the two things I like best: Netscape uh, and Pixar, because you know, Toy Story is a great movie, and uh, and Netscape was a pretty cool internet browser that I used. So, um, so, so anyway, all that to say, like, there's this one part of me that sort of just had a lot of fun with the, the mm-hmm. idea of like sort of building wealth. And then I'd say the other part would be um, uh, back to the, like less the, to, if you, if they're two dynamics, right, sort of fear and shame would be more on the shame side, right? If like, this is a lot of fun. And like, it, when it, when it, the consistency, building the discipline, right, in my own like world and life, that's been the work, right, for me of yeah. how do I make sure I'm, I'm establishing the disciplines that really matter, right, uh, for, for long term financial health and security. And, uh, and how do I like make sure I, I keep that sort of uh, open attitude, right, in my own, like, it's, it's easier when you're, to me, for anyone, I'll speak for myself, right, it's easier when I'm sort of thinking about it in abstract or even within like the work context, right, it's really thinking about the decision making when I'm making an investment, it, it has a different layer of psychology to it than, uh, than when you're talking about sort of your own, your own world. Um, some people probably feel differently <laughs> and, it's, and that's probably for good reason. Like I, I wish I probably had, you know, it, it was more, more consistent, but yeah, that's my story. Yeah. No, I appreciate you sharing. And that's uh-huh. lucky that you had a, that you had a dad that introduced you at least to the stock market at a young age. Cause even if you made some good decisions, I'm assuming Pixar probably did pretty well. Netscape, eh, who knows? Uh, they, both, they, they both did great actually. Uh, okay. You know, it wasn't very much money. It wasn't very much money, but, uh, but you know, relatively speaking, they had some pretty good outcomes. There you go. Yeah. And that got, that piqued the interest. Yeah. So what would you say uh, is the best investment that you've made? In myself, is that fair? Is that a fair answer? Or do, it's a fair like, answer. It's your answer. There's no yeah. wrong answer, right? So whatever's whatever's true to you. So yeah, yeah. I think uh, I I I remember hearing it from somebody early on. I don't even remember who, but I, I just read another you know article the other day about it. Right? It's like the most common thing to say, but I think uh, most people don't do. It. But I think investing in myself to to be able to get the most out of life. Okay. So what do you I'll mean dig by in that? there a little bit. I'm going to push on you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we can get out of life. Yeah. <laughs> um, meaning, uh, I, you know, we, like your question, I think, is around finances. And I think I'm just extra- abstracting it out further, which is, you know, we're on the, you know, we're on this planet for some amount of time. And I think, you know, I've, I'm trying really hard to make the most out of that time. And, and um, so the, you know, whether it's, um, things to do to keep my brain healthy or my body healthy. Um, okay. Whether it's things so I can get more experiences so I can bring more impact to the people that I'm, I'm working with, but making sure that it's not, that, that there are things in every day of my life that are helping me feel healthy so that I can be better at all the other things that I do. That makes sense. Yeah. It kind of goes back to wanting to make sure that you're healthy so that you can have that impact on the people that are closest to you going back to how you're defining success. But if you're asking financial investment, it was investing in Home Depot several years back. (laughs) Perfect. (laughs) Trevor, Um, what about you? This is a yeah, this is a fun question. I, uh, and I like the way Amos took his answer because you think about what is the most, uh, valuable asset that we have, um, one reasonable answer would be your sort of physical body, right? Or, or sort of yourself, right? And so by taking care of that, you can ensure that it, it sticks around right? and you get value from it into the long haul. So, um, and there's probably sort of emotional, relational, you know, mental components to that as well. So I like that. Um, I also think about the question relative to like outcomes versus process, right? So the best investment you make like does that mean best investment decision or does that mean best like best outcome and those things are not the same (laughs) like i uh you know early i'll give i'll give the answer is is sort of i think my first my first best investment right which was uh which is actually the home that my wife and i bought together right and and like i was not um uh, that was not a good decision process on my part because I didn't want to do it. I was like, ah, this is dumb. I like, I feel like I'm going to be tied to Austin. I don't want, I want to get out of here. I, 
I, I don't want to put a bunch of money into this house that I didn't get to take care of. And my wife was like, well, I don't want to be bouncing around, you know, from, from, uh, you know, to apartment to apartment every year. So we're going to buy a house. And, uh, and it, it was a great, it was a great outcome, right? A great decision because, uh, and one, it, it, you know, it, it kept us in a city that, that we now deeply care about um, and, and have, you know, strong relationships with, uh, you know, the Austin real estate market has obviously been booming, right? So um, it set us on a good path right into the future uh, that, that allowed us to do a bunch of other things, you know? And so, uh, but, but yeah, the process, the decision-making actually itself, I don't know how thoughtful I was, you know, in, <laughs> in that process. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up because I think that's a distinction between the actual decision-making process and not, you hear like, uh, I've heard poker players think about this, right? You may lose a hand, but if you played the odds right and you just got unlucky, you just got unlucky versus you make a really reckless decision and you happen to win, you're going to actually incentivize the wrong behaviors long-term. And that's kind of how I, you know, how I'm interpreting your response there, Trevor. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a lot of the venture world, right? Especially in the in the early stage world, like what hits is is like sometimes more um, can be more sort of random than than not, right? And so you you as an investor, right? It's easy to sort of um, put too much uh, energy or focus on uh, what you perceive to be doing the best, and usually that means the amount of money they've raised right, most recently, which is not which is not an indicator of long-term success, right? Um, and, uh, and so it, it's, it, it's critical. I think that, that attitude, I think, hopefully will sort of in the long-term uh, make towards better sort of financial investing, venture investing, right? By saying like, okay, how do I, how do I resist sort of leaning towards whatever, perceived, whatever I perceive to be the best outcome at the current moment? Yeah, love that. And so we've talked about the good stuff. What about the other side? What's the dumbest money mistake that you've made? Oh, God. <laughs> um, I'm glad you're going first. Yeah. The dumbest money mistake. I've made a lot of dumb money mistakes. One that, one that actually haunts me on a regular basis. And I don't have a ton of things that I'm actually regretful for in my life. But uh, I lived in LA for nine years and we had a great apartment in Santa Monica and we sold it. <laughs> it was so stupid. <laughs> like it's probably tripled in value. Plus we don't have a place in Santa Monica anymore. And it was, you know, relative, even at the time it wasn't expensive to have kept it. We could have rented it and it just was, you know, growing up without any financial education, I thought, having the cash in hand was more valuable than the asset itself. There was a lot of learning there. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. I don't know if I have a great answer. I'm trying to think through like, what would be a really like, I'm sure I'm missing some like massive, you know, bad decision that, that I've made of, of like a large magnitude, but I'm only thinking of like small magnitude decisions. Um, and, I, and a kind of cop out answer I'm thinking is, uh, is, is I have not like early on, right? I, I wish I had been more consistent about just the like get rich slowly uh, sort of dynamics around just the small amounts of money, right? Invested in, uh, in, in, in um, assets that are, you know, creating compound interest, right? And, and that like has such a good compound effect. And I even knew that sort of in my head in my early, early twenties, right. Sort of knew that, that the power of the dynamics, but I didn't always play them out. So I'd say that like, that's a kind of a, you know, simple answer or not that interesting of an answer, but, but is one. Um, I made some bad decisions in the startups that I've run. Um, I made some bad decisions in starting some of the companies that, that I've started. So I think that like, those would be another, like, like really not really assessing the risk tolerance I had before I jumped into a thing would be uh, probably be the other answer. <laughs> like that. Yeah. Awesome. Well guys, this has been a lot of fun. I really appreciate you guys sitting down and sharing a bit about the book and um, how people can think about entrepreneurship and then, you know, getting a little vulnerable here at the end, talking about uh, some of the, the good things and not so good things in terms of finance. But I want to leave you guys with the last words. So if there's anything you want to share, and then also please let the audience know the best way to connect with you outside of the podcast and where they can get the book. Yeah. Well, firstly, thank you for having us on. I really appreciate it. And it was fun to chat with you. Uh, I think for me, 
um, that, you know, the, I'll just probably restate something I said before. The, the, the thought for any, you know, in entrepreneurs and founders out there is um, figure out how to be not just metrics aware, but metrics metrics driven. You know, you can use our process or not, but it's going to be critical to your long term success. Um, and, you know, the probably the, the best way to get in touch with us right now is just to go to leversbook.com. You can, obviously, you can get the book there, too. You can learn more about um, the, the when we teach the process, with, when we work with uh, entrepreneurs hand in hand on the process, you can learn about it there and you can reach out to us uh, through leversbook.com or on Twitter and LinkedIn, of course. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you guys sitting down and uh, have a great rest of your day. Cool. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. On your way out, please share the podcast with others. It's the only way that the community grows and others hear these incredible stories from entrepreneurs and top performers. And of course, pound that subscribe button so you get notified when episodes drop every Friday. I'm William Glass, CEO and co-founder of Ostrich, and of course, your host of the Silicon Alley Podcast. Have a very profitable day. You got no time to waste, but still you hesitate.